So a while ago, I made a video about making art from thermite. I have a, uh, a couple pieces that were just hanging on my wall until recently when I moved back here. But in that video, I mentioned that the reaction of thermite is, of course, not an explosive, and it's actually a, a reasonably slow reaction. And I said that it would slowly consume a, a pile of powder. And since then, I've actually wondered how quickly the reaction front moves through thermite. And it's something that I'm about to test, which I'm very excited about, because I've been thinking about this experiment for a while. So I just finished packing thermite into some uh, borosilicate tubes. So this borosilicate glass is a very high melting point, somewhere around 300 degree, or 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit, which means that it will melt when the thermite goes off, but it should hold together for long enough that we can actually see the reaction front moving through the material if we light it at this end and let, it, let the reaction progress. And I think that's going to be a really cool thing to see. The other thing about borosilicate glass is that it has a very high, or a, a very low thermal coefficient of expansion relative to most other glasses, which means that it has a very high resistance to thermal shock, which means that when we light this and it goes from room temperature to uh, 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit, I'm hoping that it will not just shatter. So that's the first thing we got to find out. So I waited until it had recently rained to do this project so that the surroundings are relatively safe. I have a hose right there sitting by for a worst case scenario in case I need to extinguish anything around the experiment. Myself, I'm protected because I have uh, safety glasses that are rated for blocking out UV and infrared radiation, so the really intense light that comes off of the burning magnesium and thermite should not be able to hurt my eyes. I also have sleeves to protect against any sort of shards or splatters that come off that could be hot and if I need to pick anything up I've got like a real glove over here. So I have a lot of work experience around hot equipment and uh, high temperature things so it is possible to deal with things like thermite safely but for this particular experiment with a semi-confined reaction it's probably something you shouldn't try at home. So this first test is just to make sure that when thermite goes off inside of one of these Pyrex tubes, it doesn't like explode or crack or do anything uh, dangerously violent. Come on. Darn it. Will not go down that tube. <sighs> so I've tried now multiple times to light thermite in one of those tubes, and I think that the cross section, the, the area of thermite available to burn, is just too small to sustain the reaction. Even when I've gotten thermite on the end to burn, and you can see this one, there's actually a little bit of iron down in the tube, but it didn't actually continue and burn the rest of the tube. So from the previous experiments, it's clear that a rapid heating on the top of the tube isn't going to cause uh, a severe shock, although I wasn't able to get the reaction to progress through the tube. So I'm now using a larger tube, and this is going to be the, the real take, I guess. I'm going to set the camera all the way to its lowest ISO and lowest exposure, and uh, I have it all set up with a tube running vertically. It's a wider diameter tube, and I have the... Uh, Mythbusters E tape stripes going down one of the bricks that one inch increment. So I'll be able to measure exactly how quickly the reaction is moving through the tube. Light. This is ridiculous. This monstrosity of a tube. This is the largest size tube I have, so I'm hoping that it works. Here we go, we have the largest tube full of thermite, and uh, I'm only going to light the bottom half of it for now. If it works really well, I might mix more and try a lateral shot, but you know, at this point, I'm just going to be happy if I can get it to burn in a tube.
So I just came back a couple days later to retrieve the pieces of tube that I actually had the thermite burn through. And uh, I was very wrong about the speed of the reaction front. I was expecting it to like zip down through the tube and I actually had the camera set to record in, in high speed so I was going at 120 frames per second but it was only, the reaction was actually only moving at 14 inches per minute. It took like 40 seconds for the uh, reaction to move all the way through the tube and that's really slow. If you look at like high explosives they can go at tens of thousands of feet per second so this 14 inches per minute, eh, it's substantially different. So I wasn't expecting it to be like high explosive because I know that thermite isn't an explosive but I was expecting it to go faster than it did. So I'm glad that I did the test. That's I guess why we've got to be scientific about these things and actually go figure it out because my intuition was very wrong. I did however notice that towards the top of the tube the reaction occurred really quickly and it appeared to slow down as it progressed and I'm attributing that to the fact that the thermite at the top was probably packed a little tighter where I had to like shove the magnesium in and stuff like that. So my current hypothesis is that by densifying the thermite and actually packing it in, I'll be able to make the reaction go a little faster. So I have a new batch of thermite and I have a pusher here that fits in the tube. So I'm going to try to pack it like a rocket motor and really get the powder dense and see if that has any effect. Find out. So I guess this is going to be the densified thermite test. I have uh, a tube here that's full and uh, it is actually tamped down so there's no more air. If you press the top of this it doesn't puff up at all. And uh, I'm hoping that this is going to make the reaction go faster but you know last time I guessed wrong so it'll be an experiment. <laughs> That's incredible. It's crawling. So I was wrong on two fronts. <laughs> I thought that the thermite reaction would go a lot faster than it did. And then I also thought that I could speed it up by making the thermite denser and packing it together. As it turns out, both of those assumptions were wrong. And I guess I'm glad I did the experiment because without actually testing it, I had no way of knowing that. So the thermite reaction, you can see, sort of happens in spurts. And it's very much a, a little bit of thermite powder reacts, it heats up, and then it waits a minute before the next bit of thermite powder gets hot enough to react. And I was originally thinking that the problem and the reason that it wasn't reacting as quickly as I thought it would was that the heat from the reacting thermite was not getting to the unreacted thermite fast enough. And that if you packed the powder together more closely that every time some thermite went off it would be right next to another piece of thermite and that that would cause the reaction to progress very quickly. But that was not the case. Instead, it appears that the limiting factor in the reaction front movement in thermite powder is actually heat being sucked away too quickly. Now, when, you, when these uh, reactions occur in a tube, the way that I've done here, when you're done, you actually end up with this cool little iron tube with like perfectly smooth insides. It's really neat. And that's because the only place where heat is being removed from the system is the sidewalls of the tube. So you're filling the tube with molten metal and then the molten metal is chilling on the walls of the tube and actually forming this pipe. And the reason that it's so perfectly smooth and round is that the temperature on the inside is constant, the wall thickness of the borosilicate tube is constant, and the temperature outside is constant. All of those are set either ambient air or set by the temperature of the reaction or anything like that, which means that the amount of heat that is lost to the system is going to be roughly uniform in all directions, which means that when molten iron touches the walls, it's losing heat to the outside air and solidifying. 
So when that molten iron solidifies, it has given up its energy. The energy that was once keeping it a liquid has been dispersed into the glass tube and into the ambient air around the experiment. So it is no longer available energy to continue the thermite reaction, continue that propagation. Now, if you look at the results of the two different experiments, one with the thermite that I just sort of poured into the tube and one with the thermite that I packed into the tube that was denser, of course, the wall thickness of the denser tube is more because there was literally more iron to precipitate out of the reaction, which also means that there was more of the, there was more energy created, but the, there was also more energy lost and that thick ring of iron has a very high thermal mass and thermal conductivity that it can sap energy away from the reaction very quickly. So in an infinitely large tube you probably wouldn't have this problem because it would just grow out of the powder and all of the iron would remain molten. But because it is able to give up energy through the side walls of the tube, that becomes the dominant factor in the reaction. So previously I have enjoyed using thermite both constructively and destructively, but this has been the first time I've tried to understand the reaction more scientifically. So I hope you found it as interesting as I have. This thing is by far my favorite, like, science-y themed art project that I've ever done. And it's a laser cut wooden frame that holds on to four of these one foot square uh, panels of steel that have been melted and splattered through with thermite. And uh, it makes a really cool splatter pattern. And I think that when you put four of them together like this, it looks real nice.